Hi guys, welcome to another online lesson. Today we're going to be looking at bush medicines. So for those that haven't completed the, the first one we just looked at, which was Aboriginal farming, uh, fire stick farming, if you could go and do that for me first and then move on to this lesson, which is bush medicines. You're going to be able to have access to this video on YouTube, so you can pause me at any time if you want to answer the questions, have a crack at it, and then see if you've got the correct answers and I'll go back to Google Classrooms in just a second to show you where I'd like you to put those answers and where to find another YouTube video that I'd like you to watch to help you complete this lesson. So as ever we have our do now questions. So if you haven't done the fire stick farming you'll probably need to do that because all of the do now questions are related to information that we discussed in the last lesson. So the do now questions for today are number one, name an Australian megafauna animal that you have studied. So name an Australian megafauna, megafauna animal you have studied. What are some of the pros of fire stick farming? So what are some of the benefits of fire stick farming? What did early European settlers say Australia looked like? What did early European settlers say Australia looked like? What does PM 2.5 stand for and why is it so bad for human health? What does PM 2.5 stand for and why is it so bad for human health? And number five, what is, that should say, serotony? So there shouldn't be an end there. What is serotony? And you'll find a definition in the previous lesson. Okay, if you want to write these down, pause now and I'll just quickly go over the answers. Okay, some of the answers you could have had for the Australian megafauna was Diprotodon, Jomornis, Eurozygoma, Obdurodon, Prococtodon and Thalassinus. Try and say a few of those fast. That's impossible. Okay, so that's obviously the Latin names for these megafauna. What are some of the pros or benefits of fire stick farming? Well, it prevents bushfires by burning an area and prevents the build up of lots of foliage. So that's the sort of undergrowth. And they're good because they help seeds to grow and open. So we discussed some plants that actually require fire as part of their life history to be able to grow. Question three, what did early European settlers say Australia looked like? They said it looked like an estate. Um, in Scotland, we have estates. They're basically very well-maintained areas of land. And they kind of referred it to like a big park. So really, really immaculate looking land that looked like it had been well-managed. And we looked at an author called Bill Gamage, who's done a lot of work in this area. What does PM 2.5 stand for and why is it so bad for human health? Well, it stands for particulate matter less than 2.5, 2.5 micrometers. They're so dangerous because they can penetrate deeply into the lung and irritate slash corrode the al al alveolar wall. So the alveoli are the little air sacs in your lung that help you breathe. There's a lot of words in here today that I can't say. And what is serotony? So serotony is an ecological adaptation exhibited by some seed plants in which seed release occurs in response to an environmental trigger rather than spontaneously at seed maturation. So what are we talking about here? Well, these seeds actually need something in the environment to happen for them to grow into plants rather than just growing into plants because they that's what they were um made to do so they're waiting for some external trigger and the example we used was fire so some seeds won't actually germinate unless um, fire uh, comes their way and we looked at one of the pine cones that actually has this resin and the pine cone doesn't open up until that resin is burned away so that plant actually will not grow unless it's touched by fire which is an amazing evolution adaptation Okay, before we go on, I better show you where 
I'm expecting you guys to go. So if you go into Google Classroom for me here, okay, and what you should have, you'll have classwork and you'll see this, this is kind of transparent at the moment because I have scheduled it for 9 a.m. tomorrow. So I'm recording this on, what day is it? Tuesday evening. So we have Bush Medicines here in a Google Doc and plant uses and medicinal purposes for different Aboriginal um, medicines uh, in this video here. So you're gonna to have to watch this YouTube clip to answer the majority of these questions. But if you click on Google Docs, some people drew to my attention that it comes up here on the right hand side in their screen, that's okay. But it should be on the screen, Bush Medicine. And if you click on this link, you will have a Google document where I've added all of the questions, okay? And I've got the answer here. If you could answer, you could do your do now questions in there. And the fire stick farming, we're gonna just touch on the last parts of the fire, fire stick farming. And then most of these questions here are related to this YouTube video. The final thing I'd like you to do is draw a diagram of some of the plants I'm gonna talk about and perhaps include how we can use them for medicinal purposes. And I can get as complicated or creative as you want here. What I'd like you to do is draw this diagram in your book or on some blank paper. If you have colored pencils, fantastic. If not, that's okay, just use a normal pencil. And if you could take a photograph and post that into the Year 11 stream here, share something to your class. So it'd be pretty cool to see what you guys can get up to with that task. Awesome. If you have any questions, again, I'll be available in Zoom during class time tomorrow. So let's go back to here. Let's just finish off the fire stick farming. So what are the cons to fire stick farming? What are the negatives? Well, we know it can pollute the air and the smoke from the fires can pollute the air and cause health problems. If you lived close to where they were burning off, you wouldn't be able to go outside because of all the smoke. Now, we all personally experienced this in the summer. I remember I came into school one day and the windows had automatically opened and there was a lot of smoke in the building and it wasn't pleasant at all trying to speak and talk. It was really difficult and I don't have any respiratory problems so I can't imagine somebody who had asthma trying to, to breathe during that. It can kill animals. So land animals might die when people burn off because they can't climb trees or get away fast enough or get into their burrows because they would get cooked as a result of the heat. Some people say that some species have become extinct because of the fire stick farming, like the megafauna that you looked at. So if you want to pause the video there, I think there's some questions from the previous lesson related to this. So if you go to your Google Doc, there should be a question related to this. Okay, so there's good points and bad points. And I guess the main thing here is burning an ecosystem is all about balance. You need to consider preventing fire-driven extinction of fauna and flora populations. So fauna is animals, flora is plants, and ecosystems, so you can destroy entire ecosystems, caused by inappropriate fire regimes. So too many frequent fires is not good for the ecosystem at all. But you also need to accommodate appropriate fire management to maintain species and ecosystems that do require fire to persist. So it's a bit of a delicate balancing act, and when you have these um, balances, there's a lot of people that are for and against. So you have a lot of opposing arguments and it can often be quite tricky to appreciate what the appropriate strategy is. So you have to have a really solid understanding of the science behind it. And it seems like uh, the Aboriginal culture prior to European settlement had a fairly good regime in terms of being able to sustain thousands of people living off the land uh, and farming in this way. However, we also have to counter that with the extinction of the large megafauna, which we presume was related to the human activity. Okay. Right, solutions then. What do we need to do as a society? Well, we should only burn off in winter, so it prevents the fire from spiraling out of control, killing more plants and animals than intended. We don't need to do it as often, so that the forest and bush area have more time to recover, and it doesn't die out. So we don't want to do it every single year in the same spot. And do it when firemen are there so it doesn't get out of control. So we're not asking anyone else to jump out there and just do some back burning. Uh, that would not end well. Um, but what we're saying is that we have to have these regulations in place so that we can do it appropriately 
and hopefully reap most of the rewards without causing too many of the negatives. Okay, moving on slightly now, I'm going to be looking at bush medicine. So when Aboriginal people did fall sick, they used plants in a variety of ways to quell their ills, so make them feel a bit better. Some plants, like goat's foot, were crushed, heated and applied to the skin. Others were boiled and inhaled and occasionally drunk. There were also saps, which were directly smeared on the skin, and barks that were smoked or burned. So there's a variety of ways to access these medicines and this information, this knowledge was gathered over generations and there's a few people still who are aware of these things that have been willing to share that information which is fantastic and that's what you're going to watch in this next clip. Okay, We're not going to watch it together because that would make the video very long but plant uses and medicines near Warrenbinde, uh, Warrenbinda with Steve Kemp. So the link is on the classroom page I'd advise you to watch this and answer the majority of the questions on the Google Doc. Okay, like I already said, in the following section, the last part of the lesson, I want you to pick one of the plants I'm going to discuss and I want you to draw a diagram and perhaps um, what it's used for medicinally as well. And I want you to share that information on the Google Classroom with me. That'd be great. So number one we're going to talk about is tea tree oil. So most of you have probably heard of tea tree oil. That's its uh, Latin name there. I'm not going to bother because I can't speak today. And the Bunjalung Aboriginal people from the coast of New South Wales crushed tea tree or paper bark leaves and applied the paste to wounds as well as brewing it uh, to a kind of tea for throat ailments. In the 1920s, scientific experiments proved that the tea tree oil's antiseptic potency was far stronger than the commonly used antiseptic of the time. So the natural remedy here was stronger than the medicine that had been created at the time, which is insane. Since then, the oil has been used to treat everything from fungal infections of the toenails to acne. So if you go into any shop, um, I think you'd be really hard pushed, particularly any sort of pharmacy or anyone that stocks uh, products for showers, to find something that doesn't have tea tree in the shop. Uh, it's very, very popular. It has a really potent smell, but it's quite a nice smell. And obviously the medicinal purposes are quite strong. Next, we have eucalyptus oil. Eucalyptus oil um, is something that I haven't really came across that much compared to tea tree oil, but I had heard of it. Eucalyptus oil is made from leaves and they can be infused for body pains, fevers and chills. Today, the oil is used commercially in mouthwash throat lozenges and cough suppressants. So I think the first time I actually had eucalyptus oil was in Australia and had a bit of a sore throat and somebody gave me one of the sweets and I had one of them, um, had the eucalyptus oil inside of it and it worked quite well. So this is something that's been known for thousands of years but has now been implemented into modern medicine. Okay, this is a, an interesting one. I've also had kakadu uh, plum. So, or also known as Billy Goat Plum. So it's the world's richest source of vitamin C is found in this native fruit from the woodlands of the Northern Territory and Western Australia. The plum has 50 times the vitamin C of oranges. That's insane. And was a major source of food for tribes in the area where it grows. So you can get this um, extract as well. You can get oil. Um, one of the things I was taking, I think I spoke to you guys about it in class before, was lion mane's extract. Lion's mane extract is not something we're talking about today, but it's been proven to help with neural growth in your brain. And uh, this was flavored with kakadu plum, so that's how I've had it. And it was, yeah, it was interesting. <laughs> but I'd recommend you try it if you can get access to it. Okay, number four, a bit of a strange one, looks an amazing color of orange, desert mushrooms. So I don't get any ideas about mushrooms here. We're talking about um, a mushroom that can actually cure uh, issues with your mouth. So some Aboriginal people suck in the bright orange desert mushroom to cure a sore mouth or lips. It's been known to be a kind of natural teething ring and is also useful for babies with oral thrush, so oral infections in the mouth. So I don't know the first person that put that in their mouth and thought that was a good idea, but yep, yeah, it's been proven to, to help with those ailments, which is interesting. Number five, the emu bush. 
So concoctions, so mixtures of emu bush leaves were used by Northern Territory Aboriginal tribes to wash sores and cuts. Occasionally it was gargled. In the last decade, leaves from the plant were found to have the same strength as some established antibiotics. South Australian scientists want to use the plant for sterilising implants such as artificial hips. This one for me was um, the, probably the most surprising that to this day, so we're looking at a plant here, an emu bush that I had never heard of before. This is just growing naturally in Australia and it has the same or stronger properties than some antibiotics that are on the market. I think that's crazy. And so much so that scientists in South Australia want to use this plant to sterilise biotic implements like hips. I think that's crazy. I just wouldn't believe that a plant had was that strong in these antibacterial properties. So if you ever get a garden when you're older, I reckon you get an emu bush and just maybe you know, sit in it once a week. I don't know. It might help you. But I just can't believe how, how potent that is. So that's pretty cool. Okay, this one, um, yeah, it's something I, I personally wouldn't want to do, but um, needs must if you're really burnt. I can really attest to the fact, you know, I've got my pale Scottish skin. Uh, getting sunburn here in Australia is no fun, so I guess if someday this was the only thing going, I would take it. We're talking about witchery gub, grubs, and the witchery, witchery grub, can't say that either. You try and say it, and then you can slag me off. The witchetty grubs, also a good source of bush tucker, were crushed into a paste, pa uh, placed on burns and covered with a bandage to seal and soothe the skin by some people in central Australia. So, yeah, that's, um, that's an interesting one there. But again, if anyone's had a really sore burn and you, I said, look, I'll put this on here and it takes it away. I think most people would agree to that. Um, if it stopped the pain, then why not? Okay, snake vine. Snake vine is used by communities in central Australia, used to crush sections of the vine to treat headaches, rheumatoid arthritis, and other inflammatory related ailments. So inflammatory related ailments is just like the word says, something kind of gets inflamed or a bit swollen. Um, that's the blood vessels are dilating in your body. And the sap and leaves are something used to treat sores and wounds. So it has some anti-inflammatory properties, which is amazing for a, a plant. And the sandpaper fig and the stinking passion flower. So I didn't name these, um, but these are pretty good names. The combination of the two plants were used in northern coastal communities to relieve itching. The rough leaves of the sandpaper fig were crushed and soaked in water. The rub then rubbed on the itch until it bled, I think that should say. Then rubbed on the itch until it bled. So you'd rub it on so much that you started to bleed. The pulped fruit of the stinking passion flower was then smeared onto the affected area. The sandpaper fig leaves have also been used to treat fungal skin infections such as ringworm, sometimes in combination with the milky sap. So again, it's just mind-blowing that these combinations have been, you know, how many other combinations didn't work out before people figured out that this one worked quite well. Um, it's a really interesting process to think about and how that knowledge then really could alleviate some um, quite horrible conditions. If you could get rid of it just by rubbing a few leaves on yourself, um, there's obviously more to it than that, but you think of the knowledge you need to have to be able to do that well. Um, I think it's incredible. Okay, kangaroo apple. So they kind of look like little capsicums. You see the red there on the right hand side. So the fruit was used as a poultice on swollen joints. So you see where they mix things up. You maybe see these in some fancy soap places. So they scrunch up all the material and turn it into a bit of a paste that people then uh, lather on. The, the plant contains a steroid, which is important in the production of cortisone. So it actually produces, it's got a steroid. So you might have had steroids um, before if you've had something, a joint that's really sore. Um, steroids are quite strong, so you know, they're not given out that often. Do you imagine a plant has this chemical element that's so strong? I think it's incredible. 
And finally, goat's foot. So luckily we're not talking about a goat that we are taking its foot off. Goat's foot is the name of this plant here on the top right. And it was used for pain, pain relief from stingray and stonefish stings. Mobs from northern Australia and parts of New South Wales crushed and heated the leaves of the plant, then applied them directly to the skin. Goat's foot is common near sandy shorelines across Australia. So one of the amazing things I think that always why I love evolution is people needed this when they were stung by animals that live in the ocean. And then just so happens that goat's foot is near these, these shorelines. It's not like this flower is in the middle of central Australia. It's on the shorelines where people needed it. I just think that's amazing to think that they're available to people um, who needed it at the time. Okay, guys, so you'll be happy to hear that's me done. I hope you went well with the questions. Look forward to seeing your diagrams. If you have any questions, catch me on the Zoom chat um, during class tomorrow. I'll put the link on and set an announcement as well. Cheers, guys.